So this is my presentation from the oculoplastics one and from the oculoplastics conference. And this is something that Dr. Patel helped me put together. And I'm really hoping for a good discussion on, on, on this patient. I'm going to talk a little bit about the medical side of it, but Dr. Patel suggested, and I, I, I think it's a great idea to focus a little bit more on the ethical and uh, on the ethical side of, of this case. So I'm hoping to have, have a good discussion as that comes up. So this was a, a patient that was initially a, a telephone consult. So Dr. Patel was contacted um, regarding a, a patient who's an 86-year-old lady, and he was, he was contacted because he'd seen her before and helped out with, with this. So she had an advanced left forehead squamous cell that was resected in 2013, and a pretty significant reconstruction done at that point. It was treated with radiation, and she had shown up at the, at the ENT clinic, who, who had also participated in her care, presenting with new masses in the left lacrimal gland and left parotid gland. gland. And so the, the consult, so they, she had shown up at the ENT clinic, and the phone call was basically, we'd like you to biopsy the left lacrimal gland, because if it is squamous cell, which, which they really suspected it was, she will need an exenteration and hemifacial resection, um, which is, which is a, an invasive surgery. So she, she came to our clinic for evaluation. So over the past few months, she had noticed uh, this new bump over her left eyelid, and then another bump, she'd also actually noticed these at her, at her left jawline. And so she had a little bit of blurry vision in her left eye uh, and no, no pain, no paresthesias. So her medical history, I mentioned this before. So in, in 2015, so just, uh, this was just a month before we saw her, she'd had a, a squamous cell on the nose that was removed with Mohs surgery. 2013, she'd had this wide resection of squamous cell on the left forehead and at still had positive margins, was treated with radiation. And then she'd had several other different places on her skin, resections of, of basal cell and squamous cell, um, osteoarthritis, GERD, depression. And then in the past, she'd had non-Hodgkin lymphoma that was treated outside of the university, so I don't have a lot of details on this. Um, but she, wasn't, she was not receiving any treatment at that time. Um, so this is a, a picture. So you can see a, lo a lot of this is just post-surgical changes from the, the previous surgery. But what, what she had noticed and what we noticed on exam was this new swelling here laterally in the area of the lacrimal gland. So the ENT service had already ordered the imaging and this was, this was what they had noticed, a two by, two by one centimeter mass at the left lacrimal gland. Um, and then they'd also notice a second mass at the parotid gland. So, uh, sorry, I picked on Chris at a bad time last time. Are you, are you okay now, Chris? <laughs> any, any thoughts on a differential diagnosis here? Right. Nice, yeah. Perfect, kind of right where we were. I just include a little bit more of a differential. Uh, we've got OCAPs coming up, and I feel like sometimes these, these lacrimal and orbital tumors are some of the toughest ones. So squamous cell definitely bolded here, given her history, really concerning for that. Uh, the pleomorphic adenomas, pleomorphic adenocarcinoma, adenoid cystic carcinoma, uh, with her history may be less concerning. Lymphoma, she does have, have a history of uh, lymphoma and then just uh, uh, benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia, as you mentioned. So I wanna go back to the initial consult that we were called about. So we would like you to biopsy the left lacrimal gland because if it is squamous cell, she will need an exoneration and hemifacial resection. And so that is kind of the ethical discussion that I wanna focus on, um, just kind of directed towards that, that treatment plan. So if it is squamous cell, should she, so these, these are some of the questions we're going to discuss. I'm going to do a little bit more background, but I just want to introduce these so, so everyone could be thinking about them. So if it is squamous cell, should she have an exoneration and hemifacial resection? Uh, how, should, how should we make that decision? Should cure be the goal? Um, does the way we present information influence the, the decision that the patients ultimately make? 
And as consultants, because Dr. Patel was a consulting physician in this situation, what, what is our role? And, um, and so I'm going to do a brief review of squamous cell and exenteration just to kind of aid with this discussion. So squamous cell is the second most common malignancy of the face and it's the most common secondary epithelial neoplasma in the orbit. And uh, the way it frequently gets to the orbit is perineural spread. And so this perineural spread, which is, is what we were concerned about in this situation, um, was first described in 1842. And uh, um, so about 5% when, when they cut out squamous cell, you can see peri evidence of perineural spread, spread uh, pathologically. Um, but if it is recurrent, then the percentage is much higher if, it, if it's recurrent cancer. The uh, symptoms, so formication, let's see, Reese, do you know what formication means? Because I, I didn't either, I had to look it up. So it's not fornication, formication means, this, <laughs> means the, the feeling of ants crawling on, on your skin. So formication, I, I thought that was a good word that I learned. Um, dysesthesia, paresthesia, numbness, so a lot of, as you'd imagine, uh, symptoms associated with the nerves. Um, and something that's important to keep in mind is that the, the perineural spread can take a long time to show up. Um, it can be small amounts of cancer along the nerves, but then eventually that gets to the point where it's symptomatic. So it can present years down the road. Um, and uh, poor, poor prognosis for, for squamous cell spread to the orbit. Um, Five-year survival ranges between 20 and 30 percent. And this was just a nice um, uh, case series because most, it, it is fairly rare, so most of these are case series. Um, 21 patients treated, 14 died with a median time to death of three years. Um, and there's not, there aren't really good studies or good guidelines in terms of uh, treatment. Most, most people recommend exenteration plus or minus radiation. Um, and a, a definitely a, a multidisciplinary team. So because orbital exenteration is the treatment that's frequently recommended, I just want to do a quick review on, on that. So first described in 1500s and again in the 1700s, the aim of exenteration is to control the disease locally. So just get rid of the disease that's there that you can, that you can find. Um, and 40 to 50 percent of exenterations are required um, basically for this, for skin, for skin cancers, so tumors that originate in the eyelid or periocular skin. Uh, it is, there are a lot of complications with it, so fistula formation, tissue necrosis, chronic drainage, chronic pain, um, so it's not, def certainly not a benign procedure. Um, and I found one quality of life study that showed, as you'd expect, that there's significant reduction in quality of life. Uh, a lot of the exoneration studies are on what they call younger patients, so patients in their 50s or 60s. One uh, did it in, in older patients, and the oldest they had was 85. And their patients did okay, but they were very carefully se selected to be patients that were otherwise completely healthy and didn't have other health issues. Um, interestingly, so there was one comparative study that showed, looked at exoneration versus conservative management. And they had 66 patients, which is, and it was, it was sinus cancer, so not completely related to ours. They had similar survival, but the biggest problem with that is that it wasn't randomized, and so you can't really make, make conclusions on that because patients who got the exoneration perhaps had, had worse, worse cancer in the first place. So, uh, so there are some pretty amazing prosthetics that, that I learned about um, that look really good, but it turns out that most patients actually end up in, in the studies that have been done, prefer just not to use their prosthetic um, because it's awkward. It still looks different enough that people still ask questions. And so uh, I, I was surprised. The two studies I found said that they just, most people just wear a patch instead. Um, and then, uh, so survival rate, so all comers, one st a few studies said 80 to 90%, five year around 60%. But again, if it was because of the perineural spread from squamous cell that they, they had the exoneration, the survival was, was, was much lower. So uh, now we'll kind of get to what I'm hoping to spend the most of my time on is this ethical discussion surrounding the issues. I thought it would just be helpful to give a little bit of background information that we just did. 
And I also wanted to review the ethical values in medicine. I think sometimes we forget that we have these values that kind of give us a framework to look at a, a, a tough situation. And I feel like when we step back and look at what our, our community of, of physicians, what we recognize as important values, I feel like stepping back and looking at those values can kind of help us uh, look at a tough situation in an objective way and, and really make it this, a, a better decision. So these are the ethical values that are, are kind of accepted. So one is respect for autonomy. So letting, not just deciding and determining everything for the patient, allowing them their autonomy. Beneficence, so that means what we do should be good. So we should look to do good things to help the patient. Non-maleficence, so that's the, the famous one that we all, I think the one that pops into everyone's head, which is first, do no harm. Uh, justice, so fair treatment. Respect for person, so recognizing that the, they are a person, they're not, uh, they're a person, not a, not a patient, we're all, we're all human beings. And then honesty and being true in, in the way we present patients. So I just thought reviewing that might give us a little bit of background. And then just work our way into our, uh, into our uh, ethical discussion questions. So any thoughts on this? So this first one, if it is squamous cell, should she have an exenteration hemifacial resection? And then just kind of, how, how would you approach that? So any comments from, from the audience? How old is she again? 86. What are her, what, what are her thoughts on it? So uh, that's, that's a good question. And so she is a really sweet lady, but that's what it kind of gets to, to what I'm saying down below is, the way, the way you presented it to her totally influenced how she was, how she was doing it. But I think, you're, I think you're thinking along exactly the right lines. Make sure that it's her decision the, to, see, to see what she thinks or what she wants. Dr. Harry? Especially older patients, I think getting family involved is really critical. You know, mm -hmm. You're really close to your daughter, or you're, you know, you're whatever, have them come up to get the, the conference together, present facts. Yeah, I, I like that thought a lot. I th you still have to be careful to respect the patient's autonomy, but family help with it can make such, can, can be really helpful. And actually brings up something that Dr. Patel always uh, brings up that I think is a, a really good way for us to think about it. He always says, if it were your, and I, I won't do the, the accent, but if it were your mother, uh, what, would you, what would you want done? How would you, how would you take care of this patient if it were your mother? So, I mean, that's, that's another way to look at this discussion. And, I'd be interested in you know this patient aside, but just your your own thoughts on that. If it, if it were your mother, or if it were yourself, um, in this in this situation, what what would you, how would you approach that? So I don't know. I mean, I think I would be pretty hesitant to myself want to have it done, um, particularly if the cure rates are at her age. If the cure rates, you know, we don't really expect necessarily cure to be a goal for her, and I think that her quality of life may be as good for the remaining time that she has, um, depending on her health otherwise, but it may be much higher if she doesn't have a really extensive exoneration facial resection. Right. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. I, I forgot to kind of reiterate that, that they would, would also do a hemifacial resection. So, I mean, even, even more morbidity and disfiguring <laughs> than, than just an exoneration. Dr. Jokes? Yeah, so at this, at this point, no. Yeah, at this point, that, that discussion hadn't come up, so. I think that's important to maybe talk about other options, not just present with an all or nothing type approach. Mm -hmm. You say we can make you more comfortable, but do this painful for you, uh, but not necessarily try to achieve cure. I think that there has to be a middle ground in these patients. You know, not necessarily choosing a horrible resection versus just a totally hands off approach. But Yeah, I agree with that. I think, uh, I mean, especially when you look at the studies that are mostly done in younger patients, cure in this, for this disease probably isn't, you know, the, the five-year survival is 30%, you know. So, so cure, cure might, 
not be the best goal, but you know, local control. So yeah, I think that was a really good thought. Great. Yeah, that's a good thought. Um, yeah. Another thing, um, as far as the disfigurement, I mean, the veneration and any facial resection is obviously a huge and disfiguring thing. It would be important to talk to her about what's the natural course of how would she look if she did nothing? I mean, mm -hmm. would she look like a rapid mild sarcoma that's an M stage, which is very right. alarming? Or would she look fairly, I mean, she might be worried about that. Right. Right. Yeah. Very good thought. Thanks. Two things that that I, I think may really direct the role of the physician and then also lead into what is our role as consultants and, and mm -hmm. how um, how forceful we are with our arguments. It, it, it's really what is her um, I guess level of comprehension of her options. Mm -hmm. Then there's just personal preference among patients, right? We have some patients who really enjoy the more paternalistic uh, relationship where it's asking the physician to make the decision based on their best judgment, uh, whereas uh, others really want that uh, ability to, uh, on their own, autonomously make that decision. And then, you know, assuming that um, she comprehends and we, assuming she doesn't really comprehend or she just wants us to make Right, exactly, and and that I think was kind of one of the big, just one of the big things for me is, uh, you know, the the question of your role as a consultant because we do the biopsy, the biopsy comes back positive, um, probably see her in follow up, but she'd be seeing the ENT service, and and if you disagree with what they decide to do, you know, how how to handle that, and I th I think that was something that Dr. Patel also thought was was interesting is just what how you know so any thoughts on that what's our role as a consultants if it, say 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 the the information we don't really like the way that it's presented to the patient that she feels like, feels like she has to do um, the exoneration or she's giving up she feels some sort of pressure into it um, and that's that's what ends up happening what, what's what's our role as a consultant what, what could we do about that dr. Crum Yeah, but you make such a good point about face-to-face -face conversations that I think sometimes in the world of electronic medical records don't happen. It's communication between nodes. But I think I think that's a really good point about sitting down and talking. Dr. Zog? This comes up in other situations related to hemorrhoid biopsies at the hospital where we're almost asked to be procedural. You know, here's a patient, this is the procedure, this is the procedure. I think for me the key is taking a step back and
relatively low risk, you know, high yield, but the answer is high risk, especially for this one. Yeah, I, I like that. I, I think reminding ourselves that we're not just a diagnostic test, like you said. You don't order, order an ophthalmology consult the same way you order an MRI, but we're physicians and, and should use our skills and, and think about it for the patient. That's really good. Let me frame this. That would be another case we have recently. <coughs> in a hemifacial dissection, you basically have a phantom of the opera. You have nothing from the forehead down. You have a free flap that comes up from your back, and it looks like a slab of meat. It doesn't matter how good surgeons we are, that's the way it looks. <coughs> so the first question was, has your team discussed with you the option of not having surgery? And her daughter in the room says, no, no, we were told this is the best way. Probably because the patient said, I'm at your mercy, you do whatever you think is best. And I feel Gawande spent the whole book, 360 pages, saying this one thing. Tell your patients they have a choice of not having treatment. And then you made this very good case uh, for us of what would really look like. Would radiation allow you to have a reasonable three years, five years of life without looking grotesque like the director of Glasgow? Let's see where you know, so that one statement was never used. And the question arises, what is our role as consultants? Do we pick the phone up and say, what's the matter with you, you crap? Why aren't you telling them that you can't have surgery? Or do we say, don't operate on this patient and take a bowel graft and a liver out, because metastatic cancer in the orbit is a sign that you basically have scared and spread of cancer and you're going to die. Just because you're an oncology service does not mean that. You do this just because of family. Many of the people I see, they haven't seen their loved ones for five years. They show up in my waiting room and say, do whatever you can to save this person's life. Do we really do that? And how do we present this information? So these are philosophical questions. If you haven't read Atul Gawande's book, I strongly urge you. It's called Being Mortal. And then just a few months ago, uh, an old professor of mine, a neurosurgeon called 
Henry Marsh came out with a book called Do No Harm. And if you haven't read that, I would strongly urge you to read this. And it tells you a neurosurgeon's perspective about tumors that grow in the brain. And the decisions that he makes about life and death and how aggressive to be. And then how do you handle the kind of the complications that we as orbitaloid facial surgeons are faced with all the time when you get a result that is suboptimal you know, all the time. Fortunately, it's rare enough that we remember the two cases. So how do you handle that? And do you really go chasing a tumor that might be like right now being a <coughs> vascular tumor at the apex of the orbit? It's not going to kill the patient. It's not going to blind the patient. Doctor, I can't just bear having this thing in my head. I want it out. Well, there are times when you say you're an idiot. You mustn't be afraid of press up again that the patient will say, oh, he's so rude. It's your job to be rude at times. And say, don't be such a moron. You'll be blind at the end of the surgery. So this, this breast carcinoma patient was after I told you to put this case together. And that was even more jarring to me because mm. our patient has had $200,000 worth of surgery. And we have to bring our dollars and cents here. I'm sorry, but hospitals, whether you like it or not, will push you to do more surgery, overtly or covertly. This is a problem I see in all the hospitals I go to. They're very happy if you put cases on. Nobody comes to me and says, what does this patient really need this doing? Not that I expect them to say it every time. But it is good if we say, hang on, what are you doing and why? Why aren't you stepping back and allowing things to take the natural course? and then deciding whether you treat it or not. So th this second case sort of frames the dilemma we were faced with this patient. Surgery is booked for so-and-so day. Would you call up the doctor and say, cancel the surgery? We all need to have a talk with the patient and the family. But I'm not the primary surgeon. I'm not the primary physician. I'm simply the <coughs> mechanic who's been designed to make a decision about what this particular tumor is. So show of hands, how many of you would pick the phone up and say, please talk to the family and tell them that there is an option of not having surgery? No? Um, and, and, I, and I understand that there is this concern about, oh, the doctor will get mad with me, they will refer patients to me, they might think I'm intrusive. Most of us, I think, would welcome a phone call like that, and I'm proud to say the people I work with are more around. I frequently get those calls. Do you think, what do you think? Can we, shall we, should we leave it alone, et cetera? And these are conversations I think we should all encourage to have. Again, uh, although Henry Marsh's book is very revealing, and it's almost like a wonderful story, uh, Atul Gawande's book of being mortal, I think would change you if you read that. I don't agree with everything he says, but that's the whole point about philosopher surgeons, is you don't have to agree with everything someone says. And that point of Thank you, Dr. Patel. So I want to make sure that Russell can graduate from residency and give his, <laughs> his neuro-ophthalmology presentation. But just real quick, I want to let everyone know what happened. So uh, we, did, we did the biopsy, um, which was definitely indicated, and a uh, good thing we did, because uh, it actually came back as low-grade follicular lymphoma. Remember, she had that history of lymphoma. So. We, we'd actually, Dr. Patel and I had discussed this, discussed all the options, and planned on presenting it before the biopsy came back. Um, so it, it, it was interesting. It didn't come back as squamous cells, so fortunately she didn't need that. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's still cancer. Um, and so she, did, uh, she ended up seeing her oncologist in January, uh, who's outside of the university system, to discuss further treatment and complete staging. So I don't, I don't have any of those results. Um, but, it, you know, it, it shows, shows the point of do the biopsy, find, find the diagnosis. And then also, I thought the, the really big learning points were just to think about quality of life for the patients. Um, remember the way that we offer something to patients can really influence what they decide to do. And then also consider our role as consultants and, and always try to do, do what's best for the patient. So thank you, Dr. Patel, for your help with that. And a lot of small references there. And then Russell.